Chapter 22 is on neurodevelopmental disorders, and um, within the new DSM-5, there have been a lot of changes within this, um, especially within the autism spectrum. Rett disorder and Asperger's disorder, they used to be standalone diagnosis, but now they are um, diagnosed within the autism spectrum disorder. So will you see diagnosis of Asperger's and Rett on the medical chart? Yes, you will. Um, but they eventually will be getting to where they're just diagnosing it as autism only and not Asperger's or Rett's. It should just be diagnosed as autism now. Um, but we'll go into we'll go into those a little bit just so you kind of know what they are and within the autism spectrum disorder since you will be seeing those. So intellectual disability it used to be called mental retardation and uh, with that term it has been eliminated just due to the negativity that it produced and um, when it was labeled or diagnosed as mental retardation. It really just focused on the IQ alone, um, but now with the new diagnosis of intellectual disability, um, the grades and severity of this diagnosis are now based upon the patient's functions and not solely on their IQ score. So the areas that they are looked at um, are conceptual, which is basically how are their reading, writing, math skills, are they able to retain memory and those types of things. And then they also look at the social aspect. How are they getting along with others? How are they communicating? And then the other one is the um, self-management um, portion of their lives. Are they able to manage their lives? Are they able to um, take care of their hygiene? Are they able to get to work and school? Are they able to um, manage their money? And that type of things. Now they still look at the IQ of 70, but then they take those other three areas into consideration as well. So the autism spectrum disorder. So people with autism spectrum disorder, they tend to have communication difficulties, such as responding inappropriately in conversations. They have a hard time reading nonverbal cues or interactions, or they have um, difficulty finding friendships that are appropriate for their, their age level. In addition, these people, they have an overly dependent on routines. And if you get them out of routine just a little bit, you're going to see the consequences of that. Um, they are highly sensitive to change in their environment. That goes hand in hand with routines. And they are often focused on inappropriate items as well. Again, the symptoms of people of people with an autism spectrum disorder, they will fall on the continuum, and some individuals will show very mild symptoms, while others are gonna have more severe symptoms. And this spectrum will allow um, the physicians to variate the symptoms and the behavior person to person, which basically means that they can individualize care um, for that person based upon one diagnosis. Some common behaviors, um, these are for the, the little one, the little kids that are seen. So not responding to own name by one. If they don't show interest in objects or people by 14 months of age, if they avoid eye contact, if they have a delay in speech and language, um, if they have, they'll be upset by any minor changes to routine. They might show stereotyped motor behavior such as hand flapping, body twisting, head banging, and those type of of things. So 80% will, you'll see on early onset starting MNC, which we just talked about, but then also 20% you really won't see it until um, developing symptoms until two to three years of age as well. So those with autism are going to have difficulty with communication and knowing what appropriate communication and also what appropriate physical touch is as well. They will often be unable to raise their hand and wait their turn at school. Rather, they're just going to want to blurt out what they have to say. Any slightest change the routine, you're probably going to notice it because they're going to throw a temper tantrum more than likely than not. And it, the slightest routine really could ruin the rest of their day as well. So this is why we see Risperdon or Risperdol prescribed with patients with autism because this helps to control that irritability and the temper tantrums 
um, that are seen often. So because children with autism, they're very sensitive to change. These children are often in special education rooms with the same teacher year in and year out. And now as they start to get older, you often see these children able to stay in the regular classroom a little bit longer um, as they mature a little bit as well. So with saying that, children with autism, once they hit puberty stage and the hormones begin, their behavior can really deteriorate at that point. It just kind of depends on individual um, if they do or not, but sometimes their behavior can really go downhill. So we have all heard that the MMR vaccination controversy. And the controversy is that MMR develops autism. Although, you know, we can have our own opinion on it, the CDC, the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, and then also the Academy of Pediatrics, they have all conducted their own <clears throat> individual research, and they all have concluded that there is no relationship between the MMR vaccination and autism. So no relationship between the two. We've already talked about risk and Asperger's and how they are now part of the autism spectrum disorder and not standalone diagnosis anymore, but we'd still like to go into those just so you know what they are based on the terminology. So Rett's syndrome, this is a neurodevelopmental disorder that is characterized by a child's inability to physically perform purposeful movements. And if you look at that, watch that video, it'll give you a good idea of what it is. It's easier to watch the video and understand it than it is to to read about it. And so children with Rett syndrome, they, they have the autistic behavior such as the impaired social isolation or interaction, and then they have the impaired communication as well. Asperger's disorder, this, was a, this is known to the general public as kind of a high functioning form of autism as there is no specific delays in the um, cognitive and language development. The issue with Asperger's disorder is that it has impaired social interactions. Um, I took care of two students who had this diagnosis a few years ago, and both of their physical touch was inappropriate, um, and we would often have to set limits um, in the classroom and then in the nurse's office as well, um, just let them know that you can't touch like that. And um, it, they usually reacted pretty well when they set the limits and they corrected themselves, but that's just something that we have to do is set limits. And they also have a hard time understanding the nonverbal communication. Uh, with these students, what we, we use uh, weighted blankets at the, at the school, and that really seemed to kind of help calm and relax them whenever they got kind of anxious or excited as well. So if you know anyone with autism, um, it, you can talk to their parents about a weighted blanket if they don't know that. It seems to have good results. Read over these disorders as a person with autism may be diagnosed with these as well, as in addition to autism. And make sure that you read over the interventions. Most of them are going to be focused at providing individualized structure and then consistency within the environment for the patient. So play therapy, uh, it's often used to help patients learn to adapt to their environment and then to control their impulses as well. So now we go and talk about ADHD. And children with ADHD, they have problems paying attention, controlling impulsive behaviors, um, or they may, may be overly active as well. It's normal for children to have difficulty focusing and behaving at one time or another. However, children with ADHD, they don't go, you know, they don't outgrow these behaviors and they have difficulty at home and at school. Um, children with ADHD, they might daydream a lot, they might squirm or fidget, talk, talk a lot, take unnecessary risks, so we have to watch out for safety, um, have trouble take, they have trouble taking turns, or they could also have difficulty getting along with others as well. ADHD is usually not diagnosed until after a child starts school because you have to have, they have to have problems in two locations, two different locations, and they usually just wait for home and school uh, before they diagnose that. So those with ADHD, we often have to aver observe closely for safety, um, just due to the likelihood of them taking unnecessary risks. 
So your interventions um, are going to be focused on a combination of different things, medications, behavioral, psychosocial, um, and then educational interventions as well. So safety, important. We have to ensure their safety. If a child is doing something dangerous, uh, we don't want to attempt to reason or negotiate with them at that time. You need to set your limits and then you need to get them away from that activity, whatever they're doing. So no negotiation, set your limits and remove them from the situation. Kids with ADHD, they need positive reinforcement when they do something right. And I mean, that's with any kids, but especially those with ADHD, they need the positive reinforcements. They need the directions broken down with clear communication. They need to be consistent with rules, and they have to have the, you know, cons the, set, the schedule consistent. So they need a consistent rule, they need a consistent schedule, and then the communication needs to be clear, and you can't give them a lot of um, commands or directions at one time. You have to break those down individually. Psychostimulants are the first choice of medication for a child with ADHD. Methylphenidate is a multi-dosage medication, or um, it can be a daily do dose medication. Just kind of depends which one. So Ritalin is is the uh, multi-dose, and then Concerta is the one that is taken daily. Other psychostimulant medications are uh, that are used are Adderall or Vyvanse. Uh, both have been known to be used, well all three of them actually, have been known to be used as abused. You know, the drug is abused, such as the parents using them, or the parent or the child selling the medication, etc. So stuff like that. Uh, when a patient is taking a psychosimilar, they are at risk for growth retardation just because it's going to suppress their appetite more likely than not. Also, we need to take, teach patients to take medication no later than 4 p.m. because uh, it can cause them not to be able to sleep at night as well. Atomoxetine or Stratera is the only non-stimulant drug specifically developed and tested for the treatment of ADHD. This is an SNR, SNRI, which we remember is an antidepressant, and these medications are going to take a few weeks to take effect. And then there are also antihypertensive that are used. Um, the most one is clonidine, and then intuitive has uh, came on as well. And they don't really know how these work um, specifically for ADHD, but they believe that it works by helping the, the production of um, norepinephrine, which helps to control moods.